pleasure being here this morning. Uh, as you said, I'm, I'm a therapist. I've been working in the mental health field for uh, over, well, in the private practice for over 20 years and the mental health practice for over um, 30 years. Uh, I've worked a lot with uh, adolescents and children, and particularly with parents. Uh, today, what I want, you know, we're going to talk about the anger management. And we're going to talk about what parents' role, what parents' involvement could be in all this. Um, some of the things that I've worked with, worked in both with substance abuse and with the anger management, is parents not fully understanding what roles they could play in some of the change that could happen with kids. Sometimes I'll have somebody uh, drop their kid off at the office and say, I'll be back in 45, 50 minutes and fix my kid. You know, where the parent part is extremely important in this whole process. So now bear with me, let's see if this works. Hey, there we go, okay. So defining anger. Well, first of all, actually some housekeeping things. Uh, there's some handouts back there, information about my practice. There's also some newsletters. If during this presentation you have, uh, if you have any other, if you have questions, just just shoot them out there. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to you know, to try to answer them. If you want any follow-up, either be on our newsletters. Uh, we do some mailings about four or five times a year, have different things going on in our practice. There's also some uh, little sheets of paper, which I think some of you have gotten. Just put your name, email address, and if there's any particular request. I think all the slides that I'm doing here should be on your handouts if, 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 we did, if I did this right. <laughs> okay. Um, and again, what I'm gonna do here today is I'm gonna kinda of set the table here to talk about what anger management is and talking about adolescent part. Now a lot of the slides I'm gonna kinda of zip through over here because I truly just wanna set a foundation for it. Uh, I'm hoping if all goes well, probably the last part of the session, or a good part of the session, will be talking about parents' role and what we could do with this. So when we define anger, let's kinda of get, you know, we have some, we all have our images of what anger is and, and how we would define that. Uh, anger is a natural human emotion. Most of the times that people think about anger, they think about it in a negative context. Actually, anger could, could serve purposes. Uh, I did a presentation a few weeks ago, and on the way to the presentation, I heard something on the radio, and I said, this is perfect timing. Um, people always kind of, again, the associations with it, there's some productive things that do happen, you know, with anger. Anything come to mind with something productive that could happen with anger? It's a, for I'm sorry? Advocate for yourself. Right. You get, it's, it's a way of communicating. It's a way of telling us something. Uh, advocating for ourselves, standing up. It, it's a way of, of, when a person is expressing or feeling anger, it's a way of showing somebody else that, that something about this interaction, something about the situation is not making them feel, is making them feel either threatened, worried, or fearful. Um, some of the positive things that people pointed in the right direction. They positive, a, a lot of different positive things could happen. As I was mentioning, the car ride uh, I heard on the radio. Uh, anyone here that saw Eric Clapton, um, You Look Beautiful Tonight, or something yeah. like that? Yeah, that, that's a wonderful song. He wrote that when he was really angry. Can you imagine that? His, uh, his wife would come down, She this was a uh, regular ritual with her, she would come down and he asked, you know, how do I look? He goes, oh, you look really, you know, wonderful tonight. He says, okay, and then she'll go up and change, and you know, <laughs> and then they would be running late. He would get ripped. So he decided, he says, you know, after you know doing this for a long time, when she went up after the fourth or fifth time, how do I look? Oh, you look wonderful. She go up and change again, and he says, you know, I'm going to write a song about this, and that's where the song came from. Kind of interesting. Um, so there could be some positive functions to anger as well. What we have to look at is um, how, how we direct anger, how we communicate anger, how, how you know, the functions of that. Um, you know, people have their own standards, their own definitions, their own ideas of it. One family, their definition of anger may not necessarily meet what another family is looking at. I know as you guys can see, I'm very expressive with my hands, in my family, uh, with some of my kids, if um, when I get angry, I don't yell, I may not scream, but particularly my voice drops in a certain tone and my hands move in a certain gesture. And I can't even do it when I'm not angry, but my little son, when he's giving me a hard time, says, okay, dad. 
you know, he mocks me like that. And, you know, that, that, but we, and for him, when I do this, that's for him, is that's anger. You know, that's, okay, Dad, stop yelling at me. You know, for other people, when I, if I tell them that story, well, that, that's nothing. Boy, you should really see anger in our family. So it's really a, a kind of a subjective interpretation of events and situations. So there's many factors that are involved in there in defining an anger moment. Um, you talk about timing. This is really interesting. I don't know who, how many people have read the newspaper about the Rutgers, I think it's Rutgers coach. Anyone kind of? Um, his coach, uh, I, no, college coach, I'm sorry. College coach. Um, just verbally abusing and berating his players, throwing basketballs at them, uh, you know, calling them uh, racial, I think racial slurs, uh, just making a whole bunch, I mean, he would berate these players, and it got caught on video, and they they initially uh, reprimanded him, then got the, some of those videos hit viral, and then he wound up getting fired. Uh, I may be dating myself, anyone remember Bobby Knight? Mike Dick, uh, yeah, those are all guys who certainly had anger, anger management moments or anger management reputations. But in those particular times that they were living and going through, that, that those things weren't, were, were kind of looked at a lot differently. Now, sometimes with our kids and working with the kids, we could have the same issues coming up from, from one setting to another. And when we think about how many different transitions kids make during the course of a day or a time, and expectations from one may be different than expectations from another. Sometimes if there's teachers, uh, teachers may be in different moods one day or the other. So there's not always going to be this consistency. So the timing, I mentioned about the, you know, the, um, you know, that it's uh, the environment, culture. I mean, those are all aspects of what defines anger. Family history, you know, what's acceptable in one family may not be acceptable in another. You know, I certainly talk with a lot of, work with a lot of couples who, uh, you know, who, whose wives would, or, or husbands either way, uh, when they're going to each other's houses for, for dinners or family events, there's certainly huge transitions that one has to make going from one to the other. I certainly know in my family, you know, we always had these very cross conversations. We would all be talking to each other. Sometimes we would have good natured kidding, maybe sometimes not so good natured, but it would be very loud and very boisterous in my family. And I know with my wife, when we went to her family, everyone actually talked in turn and didn't talk over each other. It's kind of a you know, weird experience for both of us. So those are things that, you know, family history and what we bring into it. You know, I've worked a lot with couples who say, you know, one woman I was working with, she says, well, that's just the way my family does it. You know, we yell, we scream, we swear. Yeah. So, um, understanding, so we, we have a lot of different elements that comes into it. When we talk about anger management, it's not just a standalone event. You know, we have anger issues, we have anger moments, but usually what, we're, what brings people in is a series or pattern of interactions that result in negative consequences. So we go back to Mike Ditka. We go back to Bobby Knight. No negative you know, consequences were attached to some of the things that they were doing. Although I don't know if any of you remember this, Mike Ditka got real angry one time and punched, I think it was a locker and broke his hand. You know, that was the only thing, but that really didn't stop him. In fact, some of this was, uh, with, with him, was glorified, and with Bobby Knight, oh, that's Bobby. You know, so there's a lot of it, but now, Again, things that there's more negative connotations, there's no more negative consequences that are attached to that. Okay. Um, let's we'll talk about unconscious and conscious um, anger. Uh, unconscious, it could happen very rapidly. We're less aware of factors leading to it. And there's usually a physiological, it, there's, it's a physiological start to it before we're even consciously aware of it. So, uh, an example would be is if I'm walking into a room and I may not feel particularly good about myself and there's other people there they're laughing at a joke and as I walk in I hear people laughing so I may uh, not even aware of all the events all the, the thought processes involved in that I may react you know angrily from that I 
I may have an anger response to it without really being conscious of, of why I'm being angry or what really triggered it. And we'll talk more about this. I work a lot with couples where I'll talk about, I'll work with couples and parents and they'll say, well, we got into this huge argument. And, well, uh, oftentimes they may not even remember what led up to those arguments, let alone what they were saying. They just remember the feeling that they were getting from that. So those are things that may be working at more of an unconscious, unaware, uh, and, and part of our job as parents is getting kids to understand these connections. You know, how we get from point A to point B. So conscious. Conscious is some, some things that we usually see, uh, there's usually thoughts or beliefs uh, that are associated with that. Uh, some of the thoughts and beliefs could be um, there, there's a lot of uh, think, you know, errors in thinking the kids may get. This always happens to me. Uh, that they're, boy, this is unfair. Um, they, they may see themselves more as a victim with some of these. So there, there may be, and there's a difference between thoughts and beliefs. If my belief system is telling me these things, I'm always a victim, these things are always happening to me, versus a thought. You know, so if, I'll give you another example. I work with a gentleman who, um, uh, I use a, a, a metaphor, if you're driving to the pharmacy, it's late at night, there's snow on the ground. Uh, as you're pulling up there, there's one car in front of you that takes up the last two spots. So that means you have to go all the way around and you know, back to the pharmacy. When you're walking up, make matters worse, you can step in a slush puddle. So you pass the gentleman as you're walking into the pharmacy, and maybe you guys think about this as well. You're passing, as you pass that gentleman who double parked, he already took care of his business, you're walking past, what are your initial thoughts? I worked with one gentleman who said, uh, he's just a, you know, most people say, oh, that guy's a jerk. Some may say things, some may not, you know, but they certainly have thoughts of, of, of anger. Continue along, you walk to the pharmacist, and the pharmacist is shaking her head, and he asks, what, you know, you seem bothered, what's going on? Well, you see that gentleman that just passed us, the guy that double parked, yeah, well, what about him? Well, he just found out tonight his wife is terminally ill and this guy is beside himself. So the thought of this guy's a jerk, this guy's selfish, why, you know, th that's a thought. When we talk about that and we address that, most of the people, not all, but most of the people always say, oh, I feel like such a jerk for even thinking that. So those are thoughts. A belief is I work with another gentleman who says, well, that's too bad, but that SOB should be double parking anyway. So that's more of an ingrained belief system that becomes sometimes a little bit more challenging to deal with. So usually with the conscious, there's more of an association. There's more of an awareness. There's more of, of a connectedness of, of what's getting you from point A to point B. Not necessarily that they want to change that, but that there's more uh, awareness that's created from that. Right. Again, I'm gonna speak through a lot of this. If there's questions, just let me know. Difference between anger and aggression. Uh, anger is okay. Again, we all experience that. Well, I'll tell people when they come into the office, you know, I'm not going to work on anger elimination. You know, that, that would be a lobotomy and I don't do those things. Mm -hmm. uh, anger, what, what it is, is how we can work on is the mismanagement of anger and how oftentimes it may come out and does come out in aggression. Now, when we think about aggression, we don't have to think about aggression as necessarily physical. You know, those are the things I, I usually screen for in my practice, but some of the things I'll add is, is uh, it, does it ever get, uh, do you ever get physical? Does anything physical? Oh, no, no, it doesn't. <coughs> and I says, well, how about this? Do you ever like punch walls or throw things or does any of those things? You know, well, yeah, yeah, that happens, but it doesn't get physical. So physical doesn't necessarily mean person to person uh, physicality. It doesn't mean, you know, hitting or punch. It, it could certainly mean throwing things around. Well, you know, then I'll ask, well, where do you throw? Well, sort of landed by him or her or whatever, you know, well, just miss their heads. You know, I, I think that that's, again, th those are things when we talk about the physical part, and, uh, you know, that's a part of it. And that's what I try to educate them as well. So we also talk about, I talked about the difference between anger and aggression. There's also two types of aggression. 
there's what we call predatory aggression and defensive aggression. Predatory aggression is when we, you know, when, when there's more of, I, mean, I don't see too much of this in the practice, uh, maybe fall more under the domestic violence, you know, where um, uh, you, you may have abusers there, or it may happen with people in, in other types of, but it's more of, a, of an intent to harm, you know, uh, an aggressive, sort of like, uh, it, it, you know, hunting, you know, kind of some of the hunting, act, you know, instincts. Defensive is what we see most of the people come into the practice for, is a reaction to what they feel is a perceived threat, fear, or situation. Uh, just for your information, these are things that, that actually with research has indicated, they, they can't, they, these, types of, these types of connections with the different types of aggression, we can't access these both at the same time. Kind of picture this as a, a, a lioness hunting for food, and at the same time trying to protect her cubs. You know, those are two different instincts and two different um, types of aggression that it's either one or the other. So now we also have different ways to express our anger. It may not always be physical. Uh, anger managements can come in a lot of different sizes, shapes, and forms. It's not always in the traditional sense. You know, you do this little thing about Facebook, probably about, <laughs> As an aside, probably about uh, maybe once or twice a month, I'll get somebody coming in because of some travesty that happens on Facebook or something in regards to that, especially with the younger ones. Uh, I'm not well versed on it. I know our company is on it, but that's more of a kind of a website thing. But I, I certainly know, you know, with with um, that, you know, defriend is it defriending? If you un unfriending, unfriending. You know, with that, so that that's usually good for one or two people coming in a month for that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how anger actually happens. So the amygdala is a part of our brain. There you go. Um, that's constantly scanning for danger. Uh, it, it's looking and, and trying to determine, uh, it, you know, and assess certain situations. It's supposed to, it looks at different things. It looks for things like loud noises, uh, changes of environment. So it's constantly scanning. And what it, if it determines that there is uh, a threat, it sends a message to the um, hippocampus. And then within a few seconds, we make a decision from there about what to do with that perceived threat. So perceived threats or threats could mean a lot of different things. It could mean a noise. Uh, it could mean um, uh, a sudden movement. Uh, it could mean um, uh, different types of environmental uh, stimulus. I mean, you, you, you think about it, if, I'm, if you're walking down the street and you hear a, a jackhammer going with some construction, you know, your first reaction is to, to kind of assess, and most of the time, is where that's coming from and what that's about. That's our amygdala telling us something is happening here that we really need to pay attention to. Sometimes it gets activated. If we're walking down the street, it's kind of dark at night, and we see a suspicious character, maybe kind of crunching over, looking around a little bit. We're gonna get that alert to tell us something is going on over here. And within a few minutes, or a few seconds, excuse me, we have to make a decision here of what to do. Once we decide, or once the uh, hypocampus decides what to do, and if it looks at this as, as and perceives and interprets this to be a stress, a whole bunch of different things start happening. Our breathing rate increases, blood flow to the skeletal muscle, uh, muscles increases, heart rate increases, blood sugar level. All these things are preparing our body for a flight or fight. You know, we need it, we're, we're again, we got activated here, we have, uh, we, we have a perceived danger, we have a threat. We need to figure out what to do with that. So if we have to run, we certainly want a lot of our, um, a lot of our bodily resources appropriated in the right way. So a lot of the, the blood will be flowing to the major muscle groups. 
the you know that's why sometimes if people I don't know if you guys have noticed if you get angry sometimes or stressed out sometimes hands may feel a little bit you know uh, cold that's because a lot of the blood is flowing from the smaller muscle groups into the larger ones heart rate increases um, these are all things and once we get to this and ideally as parents we want to help our children not get to this point because it's a lot harder to come down from this once these things are activated uh, it, it becomes much more difficult and that's why we're going to talk a lot about how the environment may impact upon this so the idea once this starts it, it's it's a difficult process to uh, to come back down from especially with adolescents adolescent brain <laughs> okay um, uh, one of the, the things with, with the adolescent brain is that they actually have much more synapses. It's kind of, you know, look, look at this, picture this with this wiring, a lot more synapses or they use a lot more um, than adults, you know. And, but that's not always a good thing. You know, as we get older, there's a process what we call pruning, where we use much more effective ways uh, to be able to, to use our synapses and send messages from one part of our brain to another. I kind of visualize this when I first learned about this, about how um, when I get a stereo, if I got a stereo system, I would put all these things in all the directions. I have wires all over the place. And if I call my neighbor over to take a look at it, because Mark, you got a mess over here. And he starts moving around the th different wires. The next thing you know, I got a box full of extra wires that I don't need and my TV works fine. So that's kind of what the adolescent, as we get older, that they learn from more effective ways to be able to use their synapses, be able to think through problems. And those are the things as parents we need to keep in mind. Uh, just some quick facts over here. Got the pointer one. I talked about the pruning process, uh, the pre, uh, prefrontal cortex, it lets mature in adolescence, and this weighs outcomes, forms judgments, and controls impulses. Uh, the greatest spurts of growth that happen after infancy, as far as learning growth, uh, occurs during the teenage years. Um, so, what we, what we, uh, the, you know, the adolescent brain, again, a lot less mature than adults. Uh, it's still a work in progress. And those are the things that we, we certainly need to keep in mind that our expectations and, what we, and, and how we look at this with our kids is certainly gonna be a key and important for this. Any questions so far? So again, more wires don't necessarily mean more, it means more problems. It just means less effective ways to get messages from one place to another. All right. Um, each, each of us, uh, as we go through different life phases, have different developmental tasks that we need to, to accomplish, to move from one, um, one spot to the other. Uh, when we're young, we have to learn, you know, when we're walking and crawling, we have to learn how to separation anxiety. I'm sure some of you have heard some things about that. Kids separating from, you know, uh, uh, from their parents, independent, you know, feeling more comfortable in being in rooms without them. You know, uh, as we get you know, on the other end, when we retire, there's certain developmental tasks and challenges that we experience in preparing for that phase of life. Adolescents are no different. You know, the high premium in looking good, mastering emotions, this is extremely important. Working for their independence. You know, we want to teach our young kids how to be adults. Now, Anger is one of the more acceptable emotions with adolescents than any other negative feeling. It's more than sadness, more than uh, embarrassment, more than humiliation. If you think about it, is you know how many kids that you know, teenagers, uh, young adult, or excuse me, um, or preteens will come in and say, "Hey, mom or dad, I'm I'm feeling really sad today." You know about uh, about that Johnny did this or someone did this. Most of the time. Kids, it's a safer note, especially as they get older. I mean, how many adolescent boys do you see would, would come in and, and maybe cry or, or share that kind of emotion? They, they, they won't. You know, usually they, they would act out more on the, uh, the anger side because that's much more acceptable from peers. Did it move out? Okay. So 
So some of the other ones is coming in terms of their sexuality, male-female relationships, emerging value system. This is really, really, really important. Oftentimes is I'll have parents preaching or talking or getting frustrated that their kids don't have certain values. Well, I, I kind of I use a little bit of a metaphor here. I says, you know, how many of you, and I'll ask you guys this, how many of you at age 16 had a curfew? Raise your hands. Okay, how many, for the most part, follow them? For the most part, yeah, okay, no, it's too much self-disclosure, okay. <laughs> Me too, and the only reason I, for the most part, followed a curfew is why I wasn't quite sure I could outrun my dad. <laughs> Subsequently, how many of you uh, plan to or do enforce a curfew for your 16-year-olds or if they, when they get to 16? Most of you probably plan on doing that. Okay, how long will it take you if we get a room full of 100 teenagers, 16 years old, and if we voted on it, who thinks here a curfew is a really good idea? Out of that 100, how, what do you think the vote would be if they truly thought it was a good idea? Yeah, there are probably actually, in all fairness, maybe a handful of kids that would say, I like that. That's not a bad idea. I see it. They may be lying to us, but they would at least say that. So for the most part, they're not buying into that as a value. But what they are understanding is that there's consequences attached to that, that they're expecting a behavior from them. Those are the things that we need, really need to focus more on. I could sit there and tell a lot of 16-year-olds, boy, the importance of this, this, you know, you can, it's nothing safe happens. That, and after I spend about, you know, three or four or five minutes telling him or her that, go look, it doesn't change my mind. I still think curfew's dumb. But those are the things that I think that, that oftentimes I see parents do is focus too much on a value. The values will come later, and I'm not presenting kids, you know, adolescents or, or uh, preteens are, are, don't have any values. They, they have wonderful values but they're also emerging. They're learning from our, their experiences and their environments and our role modeling, and, and these, these values may not be quite internalized until later. Can I just jump ahead? Okay. <laughs> so that's fine, that's where I want to go. So spread my mind here. So some of the things is that what we don't want to do, um, you know, is what we don't want to, you know, to look too much into the uh, you know, over explaining a value. Because for the most part, again, the kids won't agree to it. But we certainly need to start focusing on um, more so is, is what behaviors are expected from them. Okay, so I sit through kind of talking about the, you know, kind of setting the table, defining what we mean by anger. Uh, we talked about the value systems here. Uh, what's really important when you do see anger moments is labeling the, and we'll talk a little bit more about it with the parent role, but you really want to label the behavior. You know, you don't want to get into over explaining a value to them. You know, you do want to present it, this is important, this is for this, but you don't want to emphasize that or spend too much time on that. Because that's what I call getting lost in the argument. You know, explaining again curfew to most 16 year olds or 15 year olds are not going to get it, but they're certainly going to understand the expectations and behaviors that we have with them. Parent role. Sometimes uh, I've had it where uh, parents have said, boy, it's just a matter, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's just a matter of willpower. We, you know, they try to will their, 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 uh, their, their, their expectations to their kids about a power struggle. You know, it's about who could really win with this. But that's the mindset we need to get away from is we want to look more at teaching. You know, see ourselves as teachers with this. You think about this. You know, after with, with some parents that I've worked with, uh, you know, after some very long and drawn out fights or, and I says, do you really think that you're, you're, in some cases it could be, but in most cases, a lot of these adolescents or younger, or, or uh, preteens. I'm going to use adolescents, and it really works for, for, for preteens as well. But they, they may not be choosing these things. You know, they, they certainly can't say, well, the, with all the screaming and all the fighting. Um, th there can't be, you know, if it's not an enjoyable environment for the kids, or excuse me, for the parents, oftentimes the kids will be feeling some of the same things. Is, you know, I don't really like what's happening here. So if we step back and look at it and say, maybe these are things that, they, you know, that they're not necessarily understanding or grasping, but more so is that we need to kind of step back and, and look at how we could teach them to manage it better. 
uh, and again, think of it, it's communicating something to you. Uh, you also want to do role modeling behavior. You know, and again, what we talked about, you think about this, is if you as a parent are yelling and screaming, you know, and oftentimes I work with parents who say, do as I say, don't do as I do. Well, that's really not going to be effective, especially in anger management. You think about what we talked about before with a lot of the environmental cues. You know, and I, and I tell parents this. I says, you know, if I sit you down, you look pretty calm over here. Now, I'm going to tell you in about five or ten seconds, I'm going to take some symbols and just start doing this. You know, I don't do that, but I tell them that. I says, you know, if we hooked you up, we, we took your blood pressure, we took your heart rate, uh, galvic skin response, we took all these different things and measured your stress, would it go up? Just probably. I said, yeah, even a Buddhist monk would probably react to something like that. Now imagine a kid yelling and you're asking a kid to be able to manage his or her anger when they're being screamed at. It's kind of like taking an, uh, uh, an alcoholic in the initial stages of recovery, putting him or her in a bar and saying, stay sober. It could be done, but certainly that environment is not going to be conducive to recovery. And those are the things that you as parents would need to think about is what kind of environment are we providing for that? Once we get a kid to fully understand how the anger cycle works, you know, that there's an activating event, there's thoughts that go with it, there's physical component. We talked about that, that fight or flight. You know, we, we want to recognize thoughts that attribute to this. We also want to look at the physical. You know, we talked about how the, you know, once we get to that part where, where the, the fight or flight syndrome is, is, is activated, once the, the hormones are released, once things are interpreted as, you know, as a threat, it, it's a lot harder, and especially for adolescents, and especially with their emerging problem solving process, it, it's not matured yet. So these are things that we want to look at as far as, oops, I think I did one too many, there we go. Um, is we want to get them to understand in true anger management, uh, counseling talks about how we understand that it's not a continuous event, that there's steps along the way, that there's, uh, there's a physical reaction, there's thoughts that go with it. Uh, there's more components to, to managing your anger than simply doing it. There's behavioral things that we may be doing or that they may be doing. Previous experiences. Again, I talked about the difference between thoughts and beliefs. That there, that, you know, that there may be inherent beliefs that go on that we need to work on with our kids as opposed to initial thoughts. So again, anger, um, we're, they're trying to communicate. They're trying to tell us something. Um, one of the things we also want to look at is maybe there's something else going on there. Uh, anger oftentimes may just be a manifestation of something different. You know, usually if it's ADHD, you'll see it you know, sooner rather than later, learning disabilities, but not all the time. And not all the time, and, and, and remember we talked about how, how timing different situations could, could define an anger moment. I worked with this um, one, uh, uh, one youth uh, geez, yeah, she's still working with him. He's about 11 years old. And he has a, a fairly significant learning disability. Uh, they know about it. There's plans written now. But he had a, he had a substitute that day or, or someone who wasn't particularly picking up on this. And what happened is they, they were doing a test. And he had his calculator, and he just couldn't figure out this problem. So he got frustrated, and he erased his calculator. You know, he erased it, didn't have anything on there. Teacher came by, saw it was blank. Why is it blank? And the, in, you know, he was nervous. He was embarrassed. So again, we talked about anger as an easier emotion to express. He just started getting a little bit oppositional with it. Wound up getting sent to detention, and even the principal didn't catch on to that. When I talked to him and, and, and him and his mom, I was able to actually figure that there was there was a reason for it. He just wasn't getting it. He was embarrassed, and and that was just something that, that was that, that moment, he wasn't actually, he says, I really wasn't that angry, but anytime I tried to explain it to my teacher, I just got myself in deeper water with this. 
you know, and next thing you know, we got, again, you got sent to the principal. So that, those are things to keep in mind is maybe there's something else going on here. It could also be environmental. It could be part of bullying. It could be, uh, you know, boy-girl relationships. Uh, so maybe we, sometimes we have to put on our detective hats and kind of look at that. Um, again, I mentioned about, you know, anger. Um, it, you know, tells us something, it can motivate us to do some things. I think it's sometimes we also have to go into what our overall mindset is. You know, if we're certainly looking at this as being a war, and no one gets, you know, and sometimes it feels that way. And those are things as a parent, maybe we need to take a step back and say, you know, what messages am I conveying to my child here? You know, if I'm really looking at this as a war, and again, sometimes it may seem that way, those are things that are carrying over. So we have, um, we, now we also have a can't versus a no won't. Um, the the uh, can't is some of the things that I talked about that may be influencing it, other types of diagnoses. But there's certainly kids, as I said, is that are certainly trying to master their environment and figure out how to manage their own emotions. And they really truly need help with that. The I won't is more the oppositional kid who really doesn't care. Now some of the things we want to look at is what is the function of the anger, you know, of the expression of anger. So a function is, I'll talk to a parent and they'll say, boy, um, I, I, you know, my kid is always angry. I said, so what, what, is, what, what happens with that? Well, said, usually we avoid them. I said, well, what kind of responsibilities does he or she have around that? Well, none, because we don't want to talk, you know, talk to him. If he's watching TV or doing something, we certainly don't want to disturb him or her. So that's shaping the parent's behavior. You know, so that may have more of a, of, an, of a function to it. So the kid is learning is, you know, what if I express these things this way? I don't have to take out the garbage. So those are, those are things that we have to kind of look at um, regarding, the, uh, you know, regarding how we respond to this. You know, if it's, an, if it's an I won't, if we get the oppositional part, you know, we want to look at some, you know, and I'm going to just go quickly through this. We want to look at, uh, you know, we want to be clear in our expectations. We want to look at this as some of, you know, as a parenting approach. Now, how, how are we going to be able to set uh, set the tone, we want to set clear and consistent limits. You also want to disengage. You know, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but we don't want to feed into the anger. Remember we talked about how those, all those different mechanisms uh, could be kicked off when, when we're feeling this, when they're, they're feeling these emotions. We certainly don't want to do things that may activate those or further activate those. Um, I mentioned about focusing on behavior, not on values. United fronts, that's important. If there's another parent involved, um, you know, it's certainly, you know, good cop, bad cop doesn't work. You know, that they're, they're, you're still teaching and then the focus becomes on the bad cop, that it's their expectations and you're giving your child the message that this, permit, that this behavior is okay. It's just mom and dad that may be overreacting to it and just ignore them. So there's no investment in change. Uh, you want to present choices, may not, oh. So you want to present choices, you know, give them options. May not be the best options, but certainly options as well. Safety is very important. You know, it is, you know, oftentimes I'll work with parents who, who have, there may be some physical confrontations with their kids, you know, with this. And I think that's, the, that's one of the main priorities that we have to keep in mind when we're engaging and discussing about anger management. And then, <laughs> do not make consequences seem too consequential. You know, I, I worked with one parent, it was like uh, March or April. I said, you know, they, they talked about their consequence. I says, well, what, well, he's punished. Well, how long is he punished for? Till the end of the summer. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, great. Now, uh, what happens if he does something else? Or it, So there's not gonna be a whole lot of investment into change. So you don't wanna throw everything, but the, you know, including the kitchen sink at him or her. Now, as parents, we're gonna get many invitations to be angry. You know, they, they're, they're not always gonna come as nice as this invitation, but they're gonna come in many different ways, sizes, shapes, and forms. I'll tell you a short story. My son, uh, last week, 
uh, told me, he goes, Dad, I just decided, and he's a very strong little child, and he says, Dad, I, I just decided I'm not going to take, he's in high school, I just decided I'm not going to take a class next year. I, think, I just think it's really stupid to take it. I go, well, really, did you run that by your guidance teacher? You know, because you know, uh, he would know more about that. No, nah, he'll just tell me something stupid. I got my invitation, you know, right over there. But I was very mindful of it. I says, you know what, I'm not accepting this Agner invitation. So I walked him through it. We tried problem size. You know, I, I did, well, what about this? Would it be a good idea? No, no. And he kept throwing those out there, and I did a great job of not buying into him. You know, and eventually he says, okay, fine. I says, you know, maybe you need to talk to your mom about that because, you know, she's pretty involved in that. You guys work it over, and, and then maybe you guys could talk to the guidance pro you know, counselor as well and kind of figure out what to do with this. But maybe before dropping that class or not taking it next year, this would be a good idea. He goes, oh, okay, whatever. You know, so I got that, and I was very proud of myself, so proud. I went to my wife and said, Hey, guess what? You know, he threw out all these anger invitations, and I did a great job. He threw one after me. I navigated my way around, and this and that. Then, you know, my wife said, "You know, we did talk." You know, she said to me, "You know, you're, you're you know, we did talk about that last week. You know, my, my son and her, and we decided to drop that class together. You know, we thought it was a good idea." So I said, "You know, all that work." But, you know, I was slightly deflated, but I said, "You know what? It didn't matter because the process. I did a great job with it." Went back down and said. And you could have told me that in the beginning when your mom talked about that and this is what you agreed upon. He goes, oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, really? <laughs> so we're going to get our invitations. And as parents, we need to decline those. Um, and, and, and be you know, certainly conscious of that. Environmental influence, I talked about that, how, you know, how we learn this, how we react, how, we're be, how we need to master our environment. Now remember that the body is we're continually looking and perceiving threats. Um, once this, the flight or flight is, is activated, it, it becomes much more difficult. And it's also the interpretation. Remember I talked to you about how when my voice goes a certain way and my hands move a certain way, that's my, my kids maybe is are interpreting that as, as me being angry. And, and as parents, we're always gonna we're gonna get angry. And, we're, and sometimes it's it's needed. But other times is, if, and if I realize I'm trying to communicate something to my son and he's telling me, okay, dad, stop shouting, I'm getting a message. That I'm getting a message that my, my ability to capture this learning experience, what information I want to communicate to him, I got a very, my window just narrowed. So I have to look at it as what am I trying to get from this interaction to teach my child? So I may step back. You know, or or you know, or help and get or, or monitor my activities. Maybe I'll step away from the moment, or reassure him, or watch my tone and keep my hands folded behind my back when I do that. So perception is reality. Mirror neurons, uh, brain mimics what it sees. There's a lot of studies that are done that out out there about how how kids are trying to interpret and understand their environment. Um, there's studies that have talked about the mirror neurons, about if you're walking into a room, you know, and I'm seeing somebody like this, that there, my, my, uh, what I may be doing in walking into that is mirroring the certain behaviors that I'm observing. That may be a, a, a and it, what it does is it, it, it helps us as a social cue, uh, forecast and predict events. We, we learn by looking and copying, and that's our way of social, of inter, interpreting our environments. Uh, by the way, I'm really, really hoping that the match, the, the handouts are matching up with the slide presentation, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I love when that happens. All right. Mm -hmm. So we want to have associations. Mm -hmm. I, own, I have a, we have a puck, and I think it's almost. You know, you look at this picture, and it's almost hard not to have a smile. These are the things coming in there. You know, if our kids, not necessarily that I want my kid to see my wife and I like that particularly, but an image and an association versus this. You know, what, what, what do you want your child to have this perception of? By, by the way, if any, I did this at a school, and everyone gave me like blank looks with the kids, but I think that with the parents, anyone ever watch uh, Star Trek? 
This guy looks like a plain guy. Right? <laughs> I said that to one of the ki- you know, the kids, and it was just like dead silence. And then, and then one kid raised and said, "What's a Klingon?" And all those school talk. <laughs> anyway, but we want them to have associations um, that are different. You know, we don't want them associating with the fact that that this is how they may see mom or dad. Okay, now. As a parent, what we need to look at is uh, we, we want to come up and visualize three different bra- baskets. Basket A, parent rules, safety issues. This is immediate urgencies. These are things that we're going to fight our kids figuratively, not literally, to the mat with. You know, and B, things, things that there's a collaboration, more of a dialogue, a give and take with these things. And basket C is not a priority, things that we roll our eyes at and say, boy, those kids. So any idea, what, what would you guys say would be a basket A? Any guesses? Driving while drinking. I'm sorry? Driving while drinking. Driving perfect. That, that's a basket A. Immediate safety issues. Now, I talked to some parents about it, and I says, okay, you, you, you picture this. Pick do a basket A, B, and C. Gosh, basket A. Clean their room. Really? Cleaning the room, basket A. Okay, well, it doesn't leave anything for basket B. So we, we want to do this, we don't want to throw everything into our basket A. But we really, really want to make this a priority. Maybe even, you know, in some cases, for the older ones, it may even be a decision about school, you know, with this. Is, you know, well, you know, and again, if you get into the whole discussion about that, but that may not necessarily be, be a, a safety issue. Um, but these are things that are not negotiable. No doubt about it. Basket B means that there's a collaboration, a negotiation, a discussion. Now, it doesn't mean in, in curfew may be one of these things within the legal limits. Uh, so it, may, it doesn't necessarily mean if you have, I think, 1130 is curfew on weekends? For, yeah. Well, it's 11, 11, I think it is, but we'll go with 1130. So it doesn't mean to say... Um, you know, for if our kid wants to stay up till you know uh, stay up late, you know, he says, "Well, bedtime is 10. It's a, you know, and if they say, "Well, no, uh, I, I want bedtime to be four o'clock," doesn't mean you negotiate a middle, <laughs> but you give them a you give them a, a sense of some input, some give and take. So the give and take may be 10:30, but again, it doesn't mean halfway. I'm going to meet them halfway. It just means is that there's an investment in a dialogue and discussion about a, in a give and take. And again, basket C is, do I really want to go there and is this certainly worth it? You're going to have to decide which fits into where. So we want to, as parents, express empathy, avoid argumentation. You really want to roll with the, the, the resistance. And it, and, it, and it also means is a lot of your own self-talk. <coughs> You know, how are you looking at this? How are you approaching this? What are things that you're saying? What attitudes do you have? What associations do you have walking into that room when you see your adolescent? And, and what you really want to do is you want to, you know, you, again, you want to, to create more of an environment that's conducive for both of you. We want to see ourselves as teachers. Any questions or comments so far? So the, the I, we talked a lot about the I won't. Some of the things with the I can't is we certainly want to see ourselves as partners in helping our children change. But ultimately, we're not going to change. We're not going to do it for them. You know, we're, we're going to have to help and create an environment and a process for that to happen. Remember I talked about how the brain takes two to three seconds to interpret and react to situations? And if we're accessing memories and experiences that are threatening, they're already at the starting gate. Remember, you're coming into a room like this, past experiences, you know, gosh, those that, that fight or flight syndrome may, may already be activated before we even say a word. So be mindful of that. Um, and if they see them as partners in change, success is much more likely. So what do we do with that? We want to look at particular patterns that may emerge from some of this. 
Now, I, I even saw it in a, in a waiting room. I was working with a younger kid, uh, I think he's nine or 10, that um, I, we, you know, we were in the waiting room, I come out, and I see him playing one of those uh, handheld games, I think it was on his mom's uh, iPhone. So he's playing a game and says, okay, time for session. Okay, I'm almost done. Wait a minute, wait a minute here. You know, any parent ever hear that before? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. The thing that's different nowadays that we have with a lot of the tech is with, with a lot of the things that occupy kids' minds and, and keeps them busy, doesn't necessarily have a, a start and a finish time. Like when I grew up, you know, you had a TV program. You knew it was on and you knew there was a beginning. You know, to that. So a lot of the activities we could leave, a lot of the things with the kids with these handheld devices or games um, are that there's not always a, a clean end to it as far as time. I'm in the middle of this. I got to save it. I'm not at a saving point. So one of the things that I, I coach the parents with is you certainly have to look at what situation are you putting your child in to succeed. And if and if and, if, and I finally got that parent to say no more game to you, the, the kid is going to actually have to read a book or, or read a magazine or do something different in the waiting room because it would take me about 15 or 20 minutes of our session time just to get them back in and disengage from that game. So we don't want to put them in a situation where they're going to fail. And maybe these are things as parents that we also have to predict. Well, dinner's in a half hour. Okay, guess what? Okay, I'll play a game till then. Well, then we want to have a discussion with our child and saying is, well, you know, this histor historically has been an issue. What do you plan to do? What are different ways? I've had some kid, you know, some parents who have actually had the kid use a, 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 a timer that would go off. Now, it doesn't always work when a parent will say, okay, we're almost ready for dinner. You know, it would be helpful more, more something more concrete. You need, to, you need to wind it down and save it. You know, we're going to be having 15 minutes. You know to do this and not only that you may also have to look at uh, you know, again being able to predict certain situations which which a child may have a meltdown um, it, it could mean you know transitions are usually things that are characteristics of these meltdowns with kids moving from one thing to another and having a dialogue with them is these things seem to be coming up how could we manage your anger you really always want to go back to labeling the behavior that you're seeing. If you start going into and getting lost in what I call lost in the argument, well, Johnny hit me. You know, he's always hitting me. You always like him better. Well, no, I don't. I don't like him better. And you get lost you, and you start giving that, that any kind of credibility, you're getting off the topic and getting off the focus of teaching your child how to ma manage his or her so that's getting lost in the argument. And we want to get the kid, we want to get our kids invested in this. You know, we want them to get to understand, you know, that there's going to be, there's payoffs to this. Um, we want to, again, labeling the behavior, when do we see it? What, what happens when they get it? We want to identify high risk situations. You know, we want to help them with the transitions. If we keep going back to that and labeling that, helping them understand this is anger. I'm not buying into your argument about who did what or this or that. The fact is this is how you behave. I use a sports metaphor here. Um, and for the kids who are in sports, this works really well. Is if a player on another team follows you and then, and then you turn around and punch them, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I'll get thrown out of the game, or I'll get a technical, or whatever, this or that. So what becomes lost is the initial infraction gets lost because of their reaction to it. You know, and that's one of the things I try to tell parents as well as kids is that regardless of what initially started that off, is there's going to be injustices. Kids are going to be uh, taken, uh, not have things go their way. And it, it depends on how we deal with this adversity, and that's all part of what our, our learning process and growing up. So it's not our, it, it's not always the incident. We focus too much on, well, this guy fouled me, this guy did this, and this guy did that. We can talk all we want about that other player, but your reaction is what created the, the, you know, the, the concern there. Keeping in mind and what kind of resentments you're bringing in, not letting, again, the, these resentments 
with the kids as well. So some of the action plan that we talked about, parent role, environment, allowing the accumulation of stress. You want to create a, a gap between the emotion and anger. Three or four minutes, right? Okay. Great. All right. And I never thought I would be quoting Adam Sandler here. But, <laughs> but the point is that that we, we it, it's going to be very important to get into a mindset. You know, to certainly understand that parents' role as teachers, you know, getting them to understand and learning them to, for them to master their emotions and really preparing them for the adult world. It could be a pretty bumpy ride at times. Okay, I know I kind of zipped through a lot of this. Uh, questions, comments? is not you. Um, you know, we, we as parents want to, you know, think and not react. Uh, and these are things, again, we, we look at this as a journey. Yeah, I think I got about uh, 34 seconds here. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Again, if you guys have any questions or comments, you can fill out those little cards, I, those little uh, cutouts I gave you. Uh, if you need any information, I uh, want to be on our mailing list. Uh, and you can, you can leave them by the back table over there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.